Hello, everybody, and welcome to the executive uh, meeting today. Everybody who's expected <coughs> to be here is here, so there are no uh, additional uh, apologies. Um, as we plan this meeting um, in advance with uh, fewer executive members attending. First item, declarations of interest. <coughs> I'll just give a couple of seconds in case colleagues have anything. So no additional declarations of interest to declare. Second item is exclusion of the press and the public. This is in relation to Annex 1A to Agenda Item 9, the feasibility study into a Riverside walkway and new pedestrian bridge on the ground that it contains information relating to the financial or business affairs of particular persons. <clears throat> if when we get to that uh, agenda item, we don't discuss uh, the annex, um, then we don't need to exclude the press and the public at that stage. Um, if we do, obviously, we'll have to uh, exclude it. Um, could I just check with colleagues that they're content uh, with agreeing to that recommendation? Um, I can see uh, nods all around, so we'll record that we agree the exclusion of press and the public if uh, we discuss that particular information. Um, agenda item three is the minutes of the previous meeting. These are set out on pages three to 14. Again, I'll just give a couple of seconds in case any colleagues have any issues with the minutes. If not, could I please see a nod or a hand um, if you agree to sign off the minutes? Thank you, everybody. So clear majority in favor of signing off the minutes. Item four is public participation. And we have one public participant today um, who is joining us on the telephone. Um, and that is Max Reeves, who's here to talk about agenda item nine, the Riverside Walkway talking on behalf of the Helmsley Group. Um, Max, hopefully you can hear me um, and you have three minutes to talk to us. Oh, clear. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all. I am speaking tonight, this evening, on behalf of the Helmsley Group, really just to confirm our ambition and commitment to working alongside York Council to see this Riverfront Walkway delivered. Um, I just wanted to start by thanking York Council for working with us up to this point as we jointly develop this vision to reconnect the city centre to the river. Elmsley Group have made a significant investment into Coney Street, having completed a large site assembly over the past 18 months. We now control a number of large retail units on the southern side of Coney Street, including the Boots, WH Smith, City Screen. We really are heavily invested in this project. Coney Street has some incredible heritage merit and a deep, rich history. Taking the street as a standalone, there is real opportunity for significant enhancement by improving both the buildings and the streetscape itself. But Coney Street's most important asset, which it currently almost completely neglects, is the river. Within relatively recent history, Coney Street played a much more active role in the city's connection to the river. But over the years, this relationship has been lost to a great extent, as the retail core has turned its back on the water. This vision for an activated waterfront and the associated connections through to the city centre can reignite that historic relationship. This vision is not only about energising the riverfront, it's about creating that connectivity from the river to Coney Street and using that as a driver for change, both on Coney Street itself and the city centre more generally. Creating links through to provide spaces by the river that can be enjoyed both by businesses and residents. What the pandemic has done is allow an opportunity for the fragmented ownership of the street to be pulled together so that this overarching vision can be delivered. We now have a once in a generation opportunity to deliver something really special in the heart of York. The retail centre of York is vital to, to its success as a city and an essential catalyst for inward investment. This is the time for York to grasp the opportunities to repossession the city centre that have come from the fallout of the pandemic. Now, this isn't a single development that will happen overnight. This vision will include many parties working to deliver, to deliver a place worthy of its setting in the heart of York. But we're very pleased to be continuing to work alongside the City of York Council, both on the overall vision for the scheme, but also on the commercial aspects that will be required to see it come, for, come to fruition. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Max, and your comments will get taken into account when we consider agenda item nine uh, later. Thank um, you. So that now takes us on to agenda item five, which is the full plan 
of the meeting and this is set out on pages 15 to 16. So again, I'll give a couple of seconds in case anybody had anything to raise. And if not, if I could please see again, colleagues nod or indicate uh, that they are happy. So that's a clear majority in favour of accepting the forward plan. Thank you very much. And that then takes us straight on to agenda item six, which is the council recovery and renewal update um, for July. And I'll ask Ian to introduce the paper. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the report's fairly straightforward, so I won't spend too much time going through it. But just to give you a quick update in terms of the figures, um, the figures in York are broadly the same as they were reported um, in the paper. So our rate is at just over 400 per 100,000 cases. So it has tended to stay fairly static the last few days, which is quite positive. Um, the figures regionally and nationally have gone up in the last week or so, both have gone up by about 33%. Um, so actually they're all sort of hovering around about the same levels of figures. In some authorities, they are clearly higher than in York. So certainly in, across the region, there are some who are at the sort of 700, 800 figure per 100,000. On the positive side, I think I do need to stress that um, numbers in the over 60s are significantly lower. That's not to say there aren't any cases in that group, but they are lower than those rates. They are around about 100 per 100,000. And in York, that's, that's about sort of 40 or 50 people per week in that over 60 bracket. Um, and in terms of hospital admissions, though, those are around about sort of 15 and 20, that sort of figure that compares at a peak they were running, I think around about 160, 170 in terms of hospital admissions. So I think you can see what whilst case numbers are sort of you know, generally across the country going up and have been going up, the impact of a vaccination programme clearly is working. The numbers of people compared to previously is significantly lower in terms of hospital admissions. And as the council has done with its partners, clearly we are encouraging everybody to take up the vaccine who is eligible for it. Um, the only other points I think just to mention, obviously in the report, we talk about the application in terms of levelling up fund. And we also talk briefly about the citizens panel as well. And I'll stop at that point, Chair. Thank you very much, Ian. So I'll open it for any questions or uh, comments. And um, thank you to, to those who have indicated. I think as Ian says, this obviously sets out the continued work of the council, particularly as, as restrictions have eased, uh, recognising that that is a great celebration for, for many people, including many businesses, but others will feel uh, very uncertain about this moment in time. And I think we can repeat those messages uh, that we started throughout the pandemic of, of be kind uh, and let's make sure that we work together to keep uh, York open. Um, and of course, as, as Ian said, if, if people are uh, eligible uh, for the jabs to get them, whether that's through the walk-in uh, or through the Ascom Bar uh, Centre, um, that are going on, as well as making sure um, that you're testing um, where you can. Um, and uh, I think on that, I will go to Councillor Waller. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to pick up on the point that uh, you'd started to raise in terms of many businesses um, speaking to their staff and uh, customers, have um, taken the decision to retain as much as what has been uh, in existence over the previous 17 months. And I uh, am grateful to officers for preparing the campaign along the uh, theme of uh, Be York, Be Kind, uh, and ensuring that we are a space where there is um, comfort that if people want to retain wearing uh, face coverings that they, they can do. Uh, and uh, I think that's something that uh, as a city, uh, we want to create that, uh, that climate where people feel at ease. Um, a note that across the country, uh, many businesses are reporting the impact that, uh, social, uh, that uh, COVID isolation is having on their ability 
to run their company. Um, and therefore, I think it's important that as a council that uh, we explain the challenges that we are facing uh, and to explain that to the public in a way that they will understand and they're seeing it in every other part of life. Um, I must mention Green Bins and I'm grateful to the work that uh, the executive member and uh, Neil Ferris as director have done in terms of identifying that uh, there should be a sharing of the pain, uh, particularly with missed green bins, uh, to ensure that uh, whilst you cannot um, guarantee a, a collection, that uh, at least there's surety about what is going on, what people are expected to do. Um, and uh, on days like this, I, I don't envy uh, people doing uh, that, that work, which is, which is heavy going. Um, so I appreciate the work that's being done to ensure um, high take up of um, vaccinations, because I think that is an important feature of, uh, of ensuring that we're as safe as possible as a city. And the support for communities that officers have put a lot of work into doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Kilbane. Uh, thanks, Chair, and thanks for um, the report, Neil. Just uh, my question is really to do with the pandemic. So given the amount of isolating that, that, that is going on and given the anecdotal evidence that we're hearing of uh, people deleting the uh, test and trace app from their, from their mobile phones, are, are we sure that the, the data that we're getting, the test and trace data that we're getting is, is, is accurate? Um, and are we still following up uh, isolation cases with CYC staff getting in touch with them? Yeah, yeah I think um, in terms of the data, I think we would feel it's, it's accurate, but clearly I think there will be, you know, naturally some concerns given the fact that, um, you know, a lot of people are switching those off. And um, so I think we need to take that data with sort of slight caution in terms of that. Um, what you can't avoid clearly is that, you know, case numbers are at the, you know, a significant level, even, even if you allowed for a slight, you know, 20% change in that data, it's probably going to be reasonably accurate in terms of the, the broad trend. In York, that trend is hopefully flattening out. Um, I think everybody is yeah, it's widely reported, isn't it, in terms of expecting further increases in that data. Um, in terms of that, case numbers probably going up, but clearly at the same time, vaccinations and people, more and more people haven't had the two jabs. So you'd hope that in time, there's a more positive trend. On the um, issue in terms of test and trace, yes, we are still doing that, but there are some issues in terms of test and trace, which probably show and as director of public health is better place to actually give you um, further information in terms of that, in terms of what is the council's role and how that will be changing um, and then how the national system is going to work. And um, I could I could attempt to explain it, but I'd rather probably make sure we get an absolute accurate answer to you and uh, I can get Sharon to provide that. Thank you very much, Councillor de Gaunt. Um, yes, thank you. I wanted to, um, in particular, uh, welcome the references in paragraph 31 onwards to the citizens panel, um, given the challenges as an authority, um, particularly in the last 18 months, uh, trying to balance the budget and, and address the priority issues. I think it's really important that we can uh, engage with a cross, good cross-section of, of uh, citizens looking at the uh, plans for the budget uh, process next year uh, and get that um, you know, cross-section perspective as well as those from the uh, re elected representatives. Um, and just on the, the, the point about the situation with the pandemic, I, um, I do think that uh, we are at a particularly uh, challenging moment in, in history. Obviously, you know, previous um, uh, surges in infection rates have been brought to an end by a lockdown. And the intention of which we've been given is that that shouldn't be the case, but it's quite clear that you know, the um, infection rates are 
sort of growing exponentially, um, which does mean that ultimately there will be an impact on hospitalizations and deaths. So, you know, it is really important to get the message over to people, even if they are double vaccinated, they're not invulnerable. Um, and, you know, we do want to try and encourage everyone to continue the preca using precautions that uh, we've got used to um, wherever uh, there are sort of crowds of people so that we can actually try and make sure um, we minimise the impact on our city and on our workforce and our, our residents. Thank you very much, Councillor Gorn. So we've got the uh, recommendation uh, in front of us at paragraph four. We're obviously just destined to have trouble with the lights uh, today. Um, could I please see those colleagues that are happy to accept uh, that recommendation? So thank you very much. That's a clear majority in favour of accepting that. And that then takes us on to agenda item seven, which is the flood resilience uh, programme. And this is set out on pages uh, 27 and 30 to 34. And I'll hand over to Neil. Thank you, Chair. Uh, if I'd like to start by giving apologies from Steve Ragg, uh, the Council's Flood Risk Manager. Uh, Steve has had a climbing accident back and just reassure you he, he's on a road to full recovery. He's just not, not well enough to attend today. I know Steve, would, uh, who's put an awful lot of work into this report, would want to commend this to you. It gives us an opportunity to work in the Upper River catchment area that has been a long aspiration of the city. And I know he's briefed Councillor Widdinson in detail, and I'm sure she'll uh, in line to you more on the detail of the scheme proposed. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Widdison. Thank you, Chair. As we all know, York is one of the most worst affected areas in the UK for flooding. And as such, it's something that residents and communities of York have to regularly endure. Since the 2015 Boxing Day floods, it was often said that a catastrophic flood incident would only occur every century. However, recent events and the increasing impact of climate change means that flooding of this scale will occur more frequently. This investment is excellent news and a real testament to our partnership work and relentless lobbying efforts. We have long called for the wider catchment area upstream of York to be a central part of the approach to tackle flooding. The flood walls have been raised in recent years, but solutions upstream are needed because the flood defences cannot continue to be increased in height without walling our city in. The long-term resilience of our flood defences relies on the development of catchment scale interventions. This is the key concept of the existing programme of defence improvements in the city. The Innovation Flood Resilience Funded Project outlined in the papers is crucial in the development of these outcomes. It is an ambitious and innovative programme that has not previously been carried out on this scale. We'll be working with landowners and those at flood risk across the River Swale, Yore and Nid catchments upstream of York and form links to develop an understanding and agreement of how changes to upstream land management can benefit at-risk communities downstream. The project will also link closely with the ongoing flood risk management works within the city and working closely with partners will be key to the success of this project. I'd like to particularly note the progress of flood defence improvements across the city outlined in paragraphs 12 and 13. Innovative approaches combined with investment in our local flood defences will go a long way towards ensuring that residents and businesses in York are better protected in the future. With that said, I would urge members to support the recommendations as outlined in paragraph four, and I would like to thank the teams for their very hard work in this area. Thank you very much for that. Open it for any questions or comments, Councillor de Gaulle. Um, it's not a, a, a question as much as just really very much to welcome this. Um, it's precisely the sort of uh, measures that we've been saying we need to be looking at longer term rather than just trying to build higher defences within the city. So, uh, as um, Councillor Woodson said, you know, we are, I mean, since the uh, uh, over the years, you know, whether it was uh, uh, 2000 or 2012 or whatever, we've had a succession of um, significant flood events that are of a scale which uh, were deemed to be unprecedented. I think we should, at this point in time, put on record our uh, condolences to all those who've been affected by the floods in Germany. We thankfully have a bit more warning than it appears that 
the residents in those towns and villages had in, in Germany, but it does really bring home to us the importance of uh, trying to mitigate climate change and um, being in a position to warn our residents and to protect um, lives uh, where um, floods uh, may occur, uh, you know, in, in the circumstances which have been completely unprecedented, but nevertheless, you know, 2015 was an unprecedented event, uh, which we had not previously expected would ever take place. So you know, we do need to sort of work on these sort of longer term projects to mitigate the impacts of climate change. Thank you very much. Councillor Kilbane. Oh, thanks, Chair. I, I do have a question, but I've got a point of clarification, something I don't understand, if I can just get that first. Thanks. It's um, really welcome the upstream work, but on um, page uh, 31, paragraph 21, the, the second part of it, is the, the sort of last sentence in there, what, what does that mean? Does that mean that we might not be able to do it? Is that... Um, that... Neil. Uh, my understanding of this is that obviously the, uh, the, a lot of this will re rely on upper land management schemes and there's a question as the ability in terms of when it talks about the um, delivery of measures and potential buyers and connections of the sellers it's the, the sellers of it's the land management issues is my understanding but I'll clarify that with with Steve as to make sure that I've got that interpretation correct but that's my understanding. Okay, thanks, Neil. So, a potential, potential issue. Okay, thanks. Um, to, to the question is, um, I noticed that uh, we are going ahead with the Fordlands Road Flood Defence Scheme uh, and CYC is paying for most of that scheme. Um, so the question is, why are we paying for it rather than the Environment Agency? Um, and if uh, we're paying for that one, can we also pay for the ones at Rawcliffe and Tank Hall that the um, Environment Agency say they can no longer fund, or is Fordlands a special case? Neil? It's subject of a separate report that's come through to uh, members before, so we'll, I'll share that with you and again arrange a briefing as to the uh, business case that's been put forward for Fordlands Road, and then the obviously you can come in thereafter as you see fit. Thank you. I can't see any other indications. So we've got the uh, recommendation uh, on paragraph four. Can I please see uh, colleagues that are uh, accepting that recommendation? Thank you very much. So it's a clear majority in favour of accepting that. Um, that then takes us on to uh, agenda item eight, which is the Huntington uh, Neighbourhood Plan, which starts at page 35 uh, and over to Mike. Good evening, members. First of all, I start with an apology as well from Anna Paulson, who's done a tremendous amount of work, not only on this report, but supporting the local community. Unfortunately, she's been pinged by the NHS app. I think a member of her family has had COVID, so she would like to have been here this evening to present the report, but I'm doing it for her. And just to remind you that back on the 18th of March, you agreed that the, the Huntington Neighbourhood Plan could proceed to, to referendum. The report before you and the documentation sets out the result of the referendum and the paper asks you to formally make, it's a neighbourhood plan term or adopt, which is probably a more familiar term, the neighbourhood plan and bring it into full legal force as part of the development plan for York. Just to remind you, we already have some uh, adopted neighbourhood plans covering uh, parts of the city, particularly the upper and nether Poppleton area, Rufforth and Napton and Earswick. This report was considered by the Local Plan Working Group on Tuesday the 13th, and members of that group agreed with the recommendations that are before you. Just a reminder, the referendum was heard, held sorry, back on the, uh, the 10th of, of June. There were two polling stations open for a large part of the, the day in the local area. The results of the poll uh, in the annex documents, there was a 17.1% turnout. And the result on whether to accept the Huntington Neighbourhood Plan were uh, 1,144 yes, that's 86.8%, and no, 174, which represents 13.2%. So there is a positive majority of more than 51%. The referendum means that the council is now obliged to make or adopt the plan and bring it into full legal force as part of the development plan for York. 
Just as a point of detail, the neighborhood plan is considered to meet all the basic conditions and all the relevant legal and procedural requirements. And this is supported by the independent examiner's report. It is advised that the plan be made by the council given the positive vote in support of the neighborhood plan and nothing has changed since the earlier consideration of the examiner's report and the modifications, particularly Greenbelt modifications, which were set out in the regulation 17A consultation uh, to suggest that the plan would either breach or be incompa incompatible with any EU obligation or any of the covenants of rights. So nor is there any unresolved legal challenge in respect to the plan. So the next steps, if, if you agree this evening, then as soon as possible, a decision statement will be sent to the qualifying body, that's the Huntington Parish Council, we'll go to any person who has to be notified of the decision, paper copies of the decision statement and the adopted or made neighbourhood plan will be available to be viewed at this office at York Explore Library in the centre of York and the Huntington Library, Garth Road at Huntington. Just uh, a final conclusion, really, once the plan is made, it will achieve its full legal status. It forms part of the statutory development plan for Huntington Parish, will sit alongside the local plan once adopted. It contains a series of policies that will be used when determining planning applications within the Huntington Parish area. The planning law requires that applications for planning permission must be determined in accordance with the development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. Finally, members, I'd just like to thank Huntington Neighbourhood Plan Group, the Huntington Parish Council for all of their hard work in making this locally representative plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Councillor Waller. Thank you, Chair. Um, I too would like to thank the members of the Huntington um, group that uh, have taken this um, project along many years. Um, I think it is important to retain the link between residents and how land is used in the area in which they live. And this is a demonstration of this and to have such a relatively high turnout in the midst of a pandemic is a tribute uh, to that connection and the way in which it is endorsed by that local community. Um, and therefore uh, adding thanks to staff uh, from the council who have equally had to uh, cope with a, an adverse situation just at the moment to get this through. Um, I think it's it's been through due process and I would recommend that we uh, agree the recommendations in front of us. Thank you very much. I'll just wait a couple of seconds in case uh, anybody else has any other questions or comments on this. If not, Councillor Waller's moved. Um, the recommendations there that are set out in paragraph two. Can I please see uh, acceptance from colleagues of those recommendations? So thank you very much. So it's a clear majority in favour of accepting those recommendations. Thank you very much. And um, that then moves us on to agenda item nine, which is the outcome of the feasibility study into the Riverside Walkway and New Pedestrian Bridge. This starts on page uh, 57, uh, and we'll remember the start of the meeting that Max Reeves. Uh, spoke to us about this uh, item and we've got both Neil and Andy um, here to present the paper um, and uh, am I handing over to Andy first? Andy. Hi, thanks everybody. Uh, yeah, last year the council secured funding through the York North Yorkshire and East Riding Lep to explore options for a riverside walkway along the rear of Corner Street and a new footbridge over the River Foss. The principles of this proposal would realise the city's long-held ambitions to open up the riversides, would drive the regeneration and investment in Corner Street to create opportunities for our thriving independence and open up access to vacant upper floors for new homes and office space, would improve the walking route from the station to the heart of the city centre. BDP were appointed following a procurement uh, process to lead the feasibility work and the outcomes are set out in this report before you today. Whilst the footbridge is technically feasible, there are some design challenges and it would be expensive to deliver. Consequently, it is proposed that this is not taken further at this stage and is explored through local transport plan four to establish an if a strategic case exists to seek external funding. A walkway from Vodka Revolution to Lendl Bridge is considered to be too problematic to be taken any further due to complex ownership, land ownership and conservation impact on the Guildhall. 
However, a walking uh, route connecting from City Screen and Picture and Piano to Oosbridge not only has merit, but links to Helmsley Group's proposed Riverside Quarter redevelopment of their Coney Street land holdings. The council also have land holdings in the area that are key to these proposals. Consequently, this report recommends that firstly, the regeneration team continue to work with Helmsley Group to shape the emerging designs for the Riverside walkway and ensure that it aligns with and delivers the city's strategic objectives and public benefits. And secondly, that any necessary surveys and feasibility studies of the Council on land assets in the area are undertaken to understand their value and what role they could play in the wider redevelopment proposals. Just one final point to note, um, as was earlier reported in the recovery and renewal strategy, uh, the Riverside walkway was included in the Council's levelling up funding bid central government, which, if successful, would provide the match funding needed to deliver the full ambition of the Riverside walkway. Thank you very much for that. Councillor Eyre. Thank you, Chair. I think having flown through eight items on the agenda in half an hour and then getting to this, this final one, though I did note that this agenda item is twice as long as the rest of the agenda, therefore I shall speak for twice as long as the rest of the meeting. So I've been quickly putting some notes down. I think the concept of Riverside Walkway has been around considerably longer than we have, I think, in terms of people in this room. I go back to the Escher Plan, I think, which is the first time it was probably muted around, and it's not something I was around at the time of the Escher plan, but I've done little bits of research into it and it is actually quite fascinating. So one of the things he did propose, for example, was the closing of Castle Car Park. And 52 years later, we're, we're just about getting around to that. On a slightly more controversial thing, he did also propose a percentage charge on hotels in terms of providing income to the city, as well as four multi-storey car parks. So I think to apologise to the French, plus de change, plus de la même chose. It's probably very poorly pronounced. Uh, what did happen in my time was the, the New York City Beautiful Economic Plan that we had in 2010. I think some of us around here probably still have a copy of that on our, in our libraries or our bookshelves, depending on the size of our establishments. I do as well, Andrew. That described the river as the undeveloped social, cultural and economic asset, and I think that's always been true, and it has always been a massive challenge, and it's really clear that is why we still haven't, to this point, the challenges we had on Castle Car Park, the challenges we have in terms of the Riverside Walkway were much bigger. So I think reflecting on the comments that we have from the speaker, this is a once in a generational opportunity. The fact that we've got both private sector and public sector working together, we have the opportunity of the 19 million pounds leveling up fund. And I do reflect as I think I did at full council on the very strange terminology used by Mr. Johnson, but I think we don't want to decapitate the tall poppies. So I think if it's useful for York to be known as a tall poppy for this purposes, and it's worth 19 million pounds, I will happily be called a tall poppy. So I think with that one, I reflect and happy to move the recommendations on, on page 58, paragraph four. We're looking at the outcomes of the, the feasibility study. Unfortunately, at this point, the bridge isn't something that we could progress at this stage. But it's something we keep as a long-term ambition and we'll face significantly more challenges. We do have that excellent opportunity in terms of getting the walkway. Unfortunately, again, in these, in these COVID times, we've had to do a sort of a retrospective notification of the decision around the levelling up fund as the timescales that we had to submit that bid were just not possible to be able to get that into the public domain prior to doing that. But we were fully committed to making sure people had the chance to do that, to continue with the joint working as we already have done. And I think recommendation to officers as well for that, that strategic purchase that we did make on Coney Street that has given us a significant amount of play within this particular project, gives us an opportunity to work with the assets. And I think going that forward, it also itself as an asset not only gives us skin in the game in terms of the development of the Riverside Walkway, it's also a significant opportunity. I think we're lucky to have this in the pipeline. I think most high streets are, are significantly struggling with the shift from, from the retail economy. The fact that we have a scheme here in, in, in prospect of something that both enhances that retail operation on Coney Street, but also opens up an entirely new area of the city. And I think as the, as the speaker mentioned, there's connect, that connectivity between the Riverside and the non-Riverside and really starting to get that flow through, I think is a, it's a tremendous opportunity. And uh, thank both of the MPs for their support for this bid. I really hope we get some good news going forward. So with that, yeah, happy to move the recommendations. Thank you very much. Was it open the item for any questions and comments? Go to Councillor Kilbane first. Uh, yeah, th thanks, Chair. And um, taking Councillor Zaire's lead, uh, this is twice as long as any other agenda item. I'll try and sneak in two questions if that's, uh, if that's acceptable. Just the, the first one is, and we really welcome this, I think this is great, I uh, really welcome the partnership uh, with the Helmsley Group. Uh, you know, how many times have we gazed across the river and thought, God, we need a walkway over there. So, you know, really great. Um, the uh, pedestrian bridge idea that's been sort of shelved until LTP4 is, is in place. Uh, can we guarantee that LTP4 is going to be ready and done before the next local elections? Neil. 
members' expectation and Councillor De Gaon will uh, take a lead on this as to when we actually deliver that, but with the members' expectation is that we'll be deliver delivering the strategic report to members uh, later this uh, autumn, early winter. Councillor Kilbane. Uh, and the other quick question, if I may, um, absolutely, if we can get our hands on some government money, um, then let's get it. Um, can you explain to me though what the sort of leveling up part of it is? What the how, how that's going to reduce income inequality in um, in the sea? Andy. Yeah. So the the leveling up fund, the, the first criteria was basically to put each local authority uh, into a tier, and that was the leveling up element, and that put us into the lowest priority tier. Um, the the criteria for the bid then went on to look more at um, things around deliverability, what the uh, return on investment was, all those different elements. Um, we think there's an overarching narrative there around how it supports our city centre economy, that some of our lowest paid employment um, is reliant on our city centre economy, um, how we can uh, diversify the city centre to get better paid employment that, that results from our tourist economy and the levelling up fund bids all sit across those public realm spaces and investment in trying to revitalise and keep the vibrancy of the city centre. I think the key criteria when, when we had to look at the bids that were included from a York perspective is that the levelling up element was the first government's assessment and that's what prioritised the areas where in investment will go. We are in the lowest tier of that priority, but that's not to say that we won't be successful and we think we've written a really successful bid that sits around the other investment criteria that were set out in it. Thank you very much. Councillor Waller. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think if there is a an area where uh, there has been a call for ambition to resolve it, then it is Coney Street. Um, the uh, foot plates of those shops are very much uh, of the 1980s, uh, and this is an opportunity that um, presents itself, but is supported by a wide range of organisations and people within the city. So uh, it uh, has a root within the community and demonstrates that um, with the change of ownership of um, the buildings, decisions made locally are better than those made far away. Uh, and therefore the leveling up fund application does have uh, substance to it. And it is good to have a well worked out uh, project in the pipeline for whatever opportunities government funding presents itself and that we're able to demonstrate that. Um, I, I, I hate to um, challenge Councillor Eyre, but it was actually the 1948 local plan that uh, <laughs> 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 um, first motivated this, but it, it, it shows that, um, that there has been ambition for this. I think it's, uh, tribute to the work of, of staff and Andy Kerr and his team that we've got this far along uh, and to work with developers um, to, to bring them on side uh, in a way that we can work collaboratively. It's um, a good place for this city to be in when we need to demonstrate recovery. Thank you very much. Councillor Dugall. Uh, thank you. Yes, I also very much welcome this report, um, not least as has been said, the the idea of having a riverside walkway has been talked about for many years and if this is the opportunity at a time of change when the city centre is going to have to respond to the very different economic landscape that we're facing then it's good to have grasped that opportunity um, in particular noting the report it talks about um, the opportunity to bring back into use vacant upper floors which you know, with, over the years, the, the retail offer has been at ground floor level and the upper, upper floors have been mostly for storage. Um, if this opens up the potential for more people living in the city centre, uh, more diversity of uses, then it's certainly to be, to be welcomed. Um, I would just want to briefly comment on, uh, say, uh, the idea of um, a bridge Pedestrian Bridge has been around for a while as well. I seem to remember a document about 10, at least 10 years ago right. suggesting that might be an option. Um, and the, um, but 
in terms of the analysis, which suggests that um, on was it page 80, which is uh, talking about cycle connectivity, obviously there is a, a challenge in terms of where it connects to. If it's in the middle of a, an area which is pedestrian priority, that wouldn't be um, what we would want to see. And so I accept the sort of arguments that it needs to be um, pedestrian priority. But I also note on paragraph seven of the background says to that the attraction of this would be avoiding the heavily trafficked Lendl Bridge. And I would just ask that any scoping work that we do about producing a bridge looks at if we are moving the pedestrian route into the city centre onto a new bridge, that that may be the opportunity to improve the cycle connectivity across the river. I know we have already got Scarborough Bridge, which is an excellent provision, but I know that a lot of uh, people who cycle will tell you how intimidating Lendl Bridge is. So, you know, it, it might be something we need to look at alongside that part as part of our transport and connectivity strategy. Thank you. Andy. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously the report at this point is not recommending that we take the feasibility as such any further, but those can obviously be picked up in those strategic points in LTP4, but that opportunity to take pedestrians away from uh, from those traffic bridges, uh, which have got narrow footpaths and, and, and are constrained in terms of space, obviously will put pedestrians in a much better arrival point uh, to the city. Uh, I think the cycle point, the, there are potential options for the bridge uh, to accommodate cyclists, uh, the, the proposed bridge and the feasibility study. Uh, the challenge is where, where do cyclists arrive and, and dismount in terms of the foot streets, which are obviously ongoing situations and discussions as well. So absolutely, it's set out that a bridge is feasible. How that's taken forward just needs to emerge from LTP4 and how it wants to be taken as part of that strategic transport plan. Thank you very much. So we've got the recommendations on uh, Vara 4 that Councillor Eyre has recommended. Could I please see those colleagues in favour of accepting those recommendations? Thank you very much. So that's a clear majority in favour of accepting those recommendations that are set out on page 58. Thank you, uh, Andy. Um, so that uh, then takes us to agenda item 10, urgent business. I'll check with Fiona and Ian, but as far as I'm aware, there is no uh, other business. So thank you all for uh, coming. Thank you uh, to those that are watching uh, at home, uh, and I'm sure I'll see you all in the next executive.